Um, some of you may know me, and uh, I, I'm not perhaps the best known for studying impacts of oil spills. What I primarily have been investigating is dynamic processes in floodplains. So I'm interested in disturbance, I'm interested in dynamics, I'm interested in processes. Um, I've been studying the various tributaries in southern Alberta for the past 30 years, and for 20 years have been studying the Red Deer River, particularly relative to the impacts of Dixon Dam. Now, the Dixon Dam uh, produces the Glenifer Reservoir. It's upstream from here. So I'm familiar with the zone upstream from that, as well as the zone downstream. And last year, uh, on June 8th, I heard about a fairly interesting event that really tweaked our interest, and we were uh, viewing this as a scientific opportunity. So it was a chance to take a look at the consequence of yet another type of disturbance, another type of impact on a floodplain zone. So if we think about things, and I suspect that many of you had followed the media, uh, the media have some colorful descriptions of these. This is a very technical phrase. <laughs> One person's interpretation that in fact it has basically killed the ecology of the Red Deer River. And in fact, um, following from this, there was some misinformation relative to location, but there were various interpretations. We have someone suggesting is that what I saw was an area decimated by oil. We have the interpretation that it's going to affect the ecology of that part of the river valley for a long, long time. And I'm pretty sure it'll, I'll be in my grave and they'll still be feeling the effects from this oil spill. And if we think about that perspective projection, it varies somewhat from at least one government official who suggests there's going to be a slight alteration but nothing out of the ordinary for what has occurred it's going to take a little bit of time. So if we think about these perhaps opposing different views, a common element of interest is time. So uh, we were interested in two elements, how severe was it and what is the time frame for the response. I can provide you with a brief summary of what went on. This was on a Thursday night, there was a rupture in a uh, pipeline that was uh, operated by Plains Midstream. The pipeline was in fact situated uh, underneath and within the Red Deer River, uh, almost immediately downstream from Sundry. You can see it on the map on the right hand side of this and I've got an arrow that shows the location of the rupture and adjacent to that to the left you'll see that this is also the site of the outflow from the wastewater treatment plant of Sundry and from the uh, sewage lagoons. And this complicates things relative to interpretation. Uh, the pipeline was not in fact operating at the time and so the spill was primarily the material that was in the pipe. Uh, it was estimated to be in the order of one to 3,000 barrels and the um, uh, upper limit there, 3,000, has been to some extent I interpret it as fairly close. Um, we see various numbers uh, relative to the number of liters. This is about the same as 450,000 liters. Now, um, I'm interested in what went on. Again, I, I want to go see it for myself. And what I'm going to do is to show, show you a slideshow today and, and perhaps invite you to take a look yourself at, at what things look like. Um, the spill site on the upper left-hand side is actually showing the valves of, in fact, a pair of pipes. Um, that then go under the river. Um, one of these, of course, did rupture. Um, on the upper right-hand side, we have the zone immediately below the rupture site. It's a bit of a backwater channel. Again, it's coincidental with the release point from the sundry uh, municipal wastewater. Um, in terms of cleaning up, there are a number of things that you can do. Al will talk a, a lot more about that, but one thing, it's a bit like using paper towels um, for a spill here, various absorbents that are used for smaller scale, and of course there are much larger skimmer devices, and again, Al and others will talk about those. Now, quite interesting, if we look immediately downstream from that location, uh, the river, in fact, sweeps along the left bank. There's a vertical wall cut bank. And so basically, this short interval from the spill site then joins the main flow. And this took place during flood. And in fact, it was the flood event that did, as it often does, um, very probably cause the failure of the pipe. In terms of responses, again, Al will tell us more about it, but it was interesting for me to learn a bit about what goes on. There's all kinds of hydrovac trucks doing all kinds of interesting things. There's also uh, various monitoring uh, systems there for both water and air monitoring. And uh, also it's appropriate that uh, the zone becomes um, at least an advisory zone and even somewhat of a closed zone for people. 
and this is appropriate in my view, you want to minimize contact uh, by people, but also you want to have a site that the uh, individuals that are working on the response are able to do so effectively. Well, we intruded on that advisory, and in fact, we got in as soon as we could. Um, I'd heard about the uh, failure on the Friday morning. We got the crews loaded up on the weekend. Um, I must confess, I'm a fair weather uh, environmental scientist. I did wait for the rain to stop. Um, that took another day and a half, and off we went. Um, and it was interesting. We planned in advance about where we're going to try to get in and where we're going to go out at the time. We didn't, in fact, know the correct location relative to the spill, but it turned out that we made some very lucky guesses. Um, we took our whitewater raft. I brought a number of um, students along, and I got to row the river in flood. And when we showed up, uh, you can see in the upper left-hand side that, in fact, the river's about a kilometer down that road. Um, so the Red Deer was in flood. Um, we weren't, of course, able to drive down that, so we inflated the raft and floated down the road. Um, you can actually see in the lower left-hand photograph the road uh, about 10 days later or so. Um, here's our crew in the front. They actually look like they're smiling, and, and really what that is is anxiety. They're not at all sure what to expect, uh, but the fact that we put in a kilometer away from the river leads us all to wonder what's next. Well, um, when we were out on the river, uh, and it wasn't this particular day the waters dropped, but we were actually to some extent encouraged in that we, we saw right off the bat some of the um, uh, airboats that were with the Western Canadian Spill Services. And also, it was uh, while we were out there in the river and flood, there's lots of uh, debris and woody debris going down, all kinds of channels. It's a complex river, but there's lots of helicopters. So we figured if we really got in trouble, we'd pull the shore and start waving. And so we weren't too worried about it. There were other people out there with us. As we um, went from our back channel that we launched on onto the main river, um, for the first little while we really didn't see too much. And then we saw something somewhat like this, um, somewhat resembling a bathtub ring, a band of deposited oil along the vegetation. And this then gives us, in fact, a high water mark. Uh, the flood was, in fact, coincidental with the flood crest approximately. And what we then did is we floated down a 15 kilometer stretch to the next bridge down, the bridge that we refer to as the Bowdoin Bridge. Um, and this allowed us uh, to in fact uh, observe about um, uh, 60 kilometers of shoreline because it was a braided channel, multiple trips, and we got to look at two shorelines along the way. We stopped at locations with substantial oil deposition. Um, these were not randomly selected, but in fact were selected uh, based on relatively prominent uh, impact from the oil spill. So this was the first of our study sites. We call this uh, Oil Island. Um, it's an island with oil on it, yeah, a creative name, I suppose. Um, and uh, here I've got a picture of Evan uh, standing beside the sandbar willow in balsam poplar. And uh, a picture then uh, about uh, nine or 10 days later, the lower left. Unfortunately, this site was subsequently cleaned up. Approximately half of it had, in fact, mowing down of the vegetation and removal. Um, that actually turned out to provide us with uh, one more element of our comparative study in that we got to see the regrowth, the rebound, far following, in fact, the um, harvesting of material. So on the lower right, we do see the regrowth uh, of a sapling of balsam poplar. We um, are interested in the system, and this system is predominantly involved three riparian plants. Um, we see these here. On the left is the riparian tree that's by far and away the largest biomass in the system. This is the balsam poplar, which uh, is very, very closely related to the black cottonwood. So this is a, it's a cottonwood type of poplar. Um, in the center we have sandbar willow, and uh, this is a, a really interesting plant. This is really the interface plant that occurs uh, in the lowest elevation zones in riparian areas throughout uh, much of North America. Now, very surprisingly, on the right we see wolf willow, Eliagnus. This is actually related to, to Russian olive, which is an invasive plant. Um, this is slightly unusual. Usually this is an upland transitional plant, um, and I guess it tells us something a little bit about the hydrology and ecology of the system. This is slightly unusual. 
Um, we had these multiple sites and what we did is tag multiple saplings of multiple species, these three, and we followed them over the course of the summer. We'll continue. We'll vi visit them again when the ice breaks up and then we'll work through this next summer. Uh, this is our second site. We called it Debris Pond. You can see the woody debris on the bank and you can see actually a fairly heavy deposition uh, in the shrub zone uh, above that. In fact, this was probably um, the most severe depositional zone that we saw along our float. We have seen two locations. Uh, one's referred to as Johnston Pond, um, a zone that's a backwater area that in fact was somewhat prominent relative to media exposure, as well as in fact the contamination site, the release site, those two also had heavier deposition. Um, but relative to the streamside zone, this was a site that, that represented kind of the upper end relative to the intensity of the contact. Now what was interesting here is we think about floods and rivers, the rivers are dynamic during the flood, but the rivers are also dynamic after a flood. The flood basically breaks up the stability of the bed and banks and so thereafter it still is moving for weeks or months and perhaps even for years. So what happened at this site is in fact the river channel migrated into the band uh, where the heavy deposition previously was. So we can see our study uh, saplings at that site, uh, originally in the upper left. It looked like a pretty promising site for us. Uh, you can see that kind of olive colored fuzzy vegetation. That's the wolf willow again. This is unusual for those of you who study uh, riparian zones. Uh, the next picture um, below it uh, shows it uh, nine days later. Upper right then shows it after the river has switched into it. And we look a little closer at the latter part of summer, August 30th, in the lower right. And what you can see is in fact that lower zone that had previously had that deposition of the oil on those leaves and basically the leaves have absized or fallen off. And so in fact um, um, the complete removal of the material. So initially what happens is you have evaporation a large component of the crude oil is in fact highly volatile, a lot of it's gasoline and diesel fuel, jet fuel, the list goes on. And so uh, a major part of it evaporates. After that you end up with a substance that's somewhat like asphalt that is oxidized, so it's the occurrence of heat, sun, UV, and oxygen that leads to that breakdown. Unlike the aquatic system, this is not primarily biological remediation, but instead it's mostly physical chemistry that takes place. This is actually, I think, our most useful and diagnostic site. Uh, we call this uh, Brown Bank. And uh, a reminder that there's no cleanup here. And so what you're seeing in this sequence, this mosaic of three photographs, from the top left to the top right to the bottom. And in the top and the bottom, I actually have one, two, threes. You might be able to see these are individual rocks, just to allow you to see that, in fact, it's the same, same locations. Um, and so if we describe what's going on during the first site, this is about uh, two and a half or three days after the spill, um, at the latter part of the spill, uh, we have this oily material that does in fact transfer if you contact it. Um, by nine days later, it has largely or partially evaporated, so it's now a sticky uh, sort of a substance. Um, um, by a month later, it in fact is uh, no longer transferred with contact. It's a bit of a dark chalky substance and then that fades over the latter part of the summer. Um, and so again, this is non-cleaning up left hand side. You can see it and then a couple of months later there's what it looks like. And so this is what the system, how the system responds without our intervention. Now relative to the response of the floodplain vegetation, I'd mentioned that we've uh, marked and, and trapped or observed the various saplings and what we do find in this slide, moving on the X scale, the horizontal scale to the right is a higher intensity of contact. Uh, one means that the individual saplings were completely covered with oil during the first, uh, first visit. And what we found is in fact that there was uh, very, very little or no mortality. Um, and so there was, in fact, in the contact zone, dieback of those individual leaves. But the, the, these saplings, these three species, were consistently able to uh, regrow. Um, you can see those red dashed lines. They provide you with uh, the regression average, indicating that the increased contact does depress the growth rate but that's a temporary setback. We do find that these things are resprouting new shoots and they're also clonally resprouting uh, from the base. Uh, to some extent, this response is somewhat similar to what we've seen with a late frost or an early frost, an out-of-season frost, or also what you'll get with an um, insect outbreak. 
Now we had various other questions. One is uh, what about the uh, subsurface material? Did the oil infiltrate? Um, and I would say only slightly at the locations where we excavated. And so the material relative to the viscosity primarily stayed on the surface. As it dried, producing this chalky asphalt-like material, was this toxic? Well, it was not toxic to plants, at least. And here we see a pretty heavy deposition of this black chalky material. And those are now uh, new suckers of roots of balsam poplar that appear to be thriving. Uh, did this impact seedling recruitment? My guess is probably not substantially. And so these are, in fact, this is a miniature poplar forest. These, each of these little dicotyledons is a little tiny balsam poplar seedling. Well, it was interesting to think about what went on, and we have a number of instruments in our group, and, and uh, we brought along a cluster of students, and we all had our various ideas about what might work and what might not. And a couple of the more promising ideas I'll show you about, these were two of the students, Sam and Evan, and these involved aspects of imaging. In that lower right-hand picture, you might remember uh, this image from uh, the debris pool site. And again, we have this business of different species and apparently different levels of deposition. So if we think about this uh, wolf willow, the celiagnus, why does it trap so much oil? I have a scanning electron microscope, and if we look more closely at these surfaces, in fact, it becomes clear. Um, in the upper left-hand picture, and also the lower left-hand picture, we have the top and bottom surfaces of control, non-oiled um, plants of the wolf willow. And what these things that we're seeing are, with these sort of circular things, they're very similar to those little umbrellas uh, that you have in a drink if you're in a resort in Mexico. Um, these are called, in fact, trichomes, and so they're a modified hair structure, they're peltate. And they do, in fact, shade the surfaces, reducing heating. And they also, in fact, trap material allowing for boundary, boundary layer. So it turns out that these little tiny miniature umbrellas on the surface of this plant were really good at trapping the oil. And then after the oil adheres to these, the uh, sand and other suspended materials binds to that, creating a whole mixture of things on these surfaces. Here's what balsam poplar leaves look like, top and bottom again, the left, uh, upper and lower, and then oiled on the right, and you can see that deposition of that uh, material. But let's look a little more closely, and again using a scanning electron microscope, so on the top we have the control, on the bottom we have the oiled, and these things that look like mouths, these are stomata. Um, basically plants do the opposite of us, so we're drinking water and exhaling carbon dioxide, plants are taking up carbon dioxide and transpiring water. The oil basically suffocated the leaf surfaces, basically closed these stomata, these devices, these, these um, cellular structures that allow for gas exchange. Now, this idea was mine. No one thought it would work. Um, if we think of what goes on during this transpirational process, you have liquid water that becomes water vapor. That process, in fact, leads to cooling and so when a plant is actively transpiring, it's cooler. And you kind of know this. If you're in the park in the summer on a hot day, if you go in the woods, it's cooler. Part of that is shade, but a large part of that is this part of cooling the transpiration. So we should be able to detect the response from the oil coating on this gas exchange by temperature. Now, you need a device that can measure temperature. We actually have an infrared camera system, an imaging system. This is a great picture. And it's a lucky picture because in the background, the lower left, we see the plant. This is a balsam poplar sapling that had a layer of uh, a band of oil coating. But the photograph is taken with the Red Deer River water in the background, which is cool, and show with our, with our infrared camera, it comes off as blue for cool. There's a calibration on the right. And you can see that band with the red leaves because they've been coated by oil, they no longer can have transpiration. So in fact, they're about 15 degrees warmer. They're basically slightly baked, and in fact, the plant responds then by jettisoning them. Now, we can use the same imaging technique to look at the uh, floodplain zones as well. This, I thought, would be a, a kind of a colorful Hawaiian shirt, okay? And uh, so here again, it's a thermal scan or an, an imaging with infrared camera. There you can see the cool um, balsam poplar sapling, and you see the cobble, the rock, uh, on the surface, and it's getting pretty warm in the hot summer sun. And so what this is, in fact, doing, uh, evaporation, oxidation, this is accelerating those processes, speeding up uh, the natural recovery from this. 
This is just a glimpse. We have lots more information. We also have a work in process. We've got to come back and continue on, but I still might make some provisional summaries. Um, what we think is that relative to the business of rivers and pipelines and oil spills, pipelines typically rupture during floods. The flood provides the physical power that in fact leads to the pipeline failure. The material is partly suspended, um, removing that support for the pipe, there's still the shear stress with the flowing water, the rupture response. And so if we look at the timing of oil spills and rivers, often it's affiliated with floods. So not surprisingly, you're going to have oil contacting the floodplain. And so this is a very important process to understand. The vegetation sort of act like a filter. All of these leaves with the water flowing through, they contact and they collect the material. Over the period of weeks, we have evaporation and then oxidation. The leaves are up in the air, so in fact, there's more air exchange. It's like hanging your clothes up on the laundry line. They, they dry faster. And similarly, the oil, in fact, is evaporated much more quickly and oxidized much more quickly on the surfaces of these plants than it would be otherwise. Relative to the business of the science of the response of the vegetation, I talked about this oil coating reflecting the leaf anatomy. We can understand that. There's difference in terms of sensitivity. We've talked about the business of this suffocation whereby the oil layer uh, occludes the stomata, eliminating gas exchange. And there is a temporary growth reduction. There is leaf abscission, uh, but the plants are able to respound. Now, I started off with two quotes dealing with the question of time. We can, I believe, based on this case study and these observations, conclude that the relevant interval relative to recovery is weeks. Not months, not years, not decades, but weeks, okay? And so this is somewhat important, I think. Now, relative to this, um, the event occurred during a flood and these floodplain processes are natural processes and to some extent they are more physically potent or competent than in fact was the oil event. So if you went there today, I predict you would note uh, deposits of woody debris, a lot of erosion, a lot of bank change. Um, relative to that, okay, we have this superimposed effect of the oil spill. Uh, relative to plants, Oil is quite toxic to some organisms, but relative to plants, yes indeed, it's lethal to individual leaves, but not to saplings. They're able to rebound. I can further suggest some very provisional, very cautionary recommendations. The first is, um, this location below Sundry is probably an unfavorable position to, to locate pipelines. It's a braided channel, lots and lots of channel threads are dynamically moving back and forth. This is a wider total channel, but it's very, very dynamic. That dynamic channel leads to additional hazard relative to the vulnerability of things such as building bridges and locating pipelines. Relative to the operation, because flight floods can potentially lead to pipeline failure, um, ideally you want to cut off the flow of the material during floods. And this is, in fact, common practice. Relative to our contribution with respect to the floodplain vegetation, I would recommend more limited vegetation removal than might, in fact, be commonly undertaken. Because these plants are pretty resilient, they're able to rebound. Certainly after the time at which the leaves that have been coated have dropped, which is four to six weeks, after that, I'm not sure how much benefit in terms of reducing contact of the oil and other material to wildlife you get from further cleanup. Conversely, the willows, the poplars are pretty good at phytoremediation, mopping up some of these other contaminants that do in fact infiltrate. And I would predict that the biggest hazard relative to the floodplain ecology and the Red Deer River is the invasion by reed canary grass. It's happening and unfortunately as we're doing these manipulations and alterations we have the prospect of elevating the invasion of this plant. For sure we want to minimize contact by ourselves, our humans, and by wildlife relative to the oil. 
Obviously, we want to optimize or maximize or speed up the cleanup and the containment. And of course, we want to avoid oil spills. Now, relative to this, we can also think a little bit about context. In this slide, what I have is on the top, the oil floating on the bottom, the water. And the bars, and I should note that the y-axis on these scales is logarithmic. So that's tenfold differences in each of the different lines. And to put things in perspective, I have the spill of the Kalamazoo River spill, the Enbridge pipeline, two summers ago, very high profile. We have the Yellowstone River spill last summer, which in many ways was very similar to the Red Deer one. It occurred again during a flood event. In that one, unfortunately, the pipeline had been turned off, but then the operators decided to reactivate it. But what you can see is that the height of the black bar on the Red Deer is less than the Kalamazoo, while the river size, the blue bar, is somewhat higher. And again, remember that these are log scales. So in fact, we might think of intensity as the ratio of oil to water, and it's about 40-fold difference, 40-fold higher in the Kalamazoo case than the Red Deer case. As one more comparative number, 3,000 barrels is approximately the flow of the Red Deer River at that time in one second. So this is a very preliminary glimpse. It was very interesting for us to go see this river system. I want to acknowledge a number of people who helped us out. Maggie's probably in the room somewhere, um, along with others. Um, and it was scientifically a very, very interesting opportunity that I hope we're going to capitalize and learn from. Thank you very much.